Welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. Around 20 minutes each month of news, scandal and analysis you won't find anywhere else. With me, Naomi Fowler. The TaxCast is available to everyone on www.tackletaxhavens.com. It's also on the Tax Justice Network's website, www.taxjustice.net forward slash taxcast. You can subscribe to our RSS feed, to the Tax Justice Network's YouTube channel, email me on naomi at taxjustice.net, look for us on iTunes, or find us on a radio station near you. Coming up later, forget Congress, we'll be looking at the latest US state to legislate against tax havens. Stay tuned for that. Here's a quick Tax Justice News Roundup for this month. Let's kick off with some good news for a change. A Tax Justice Network affiliate in Colombia, Justicia Tributaria, has managed to suspend the sale of a publicly owned majority stake in the power company Isagen. The authorities there are looking into complaints that the sale violates the constitution and will be of little or no benefit to Colombians. There are plenty of bad experiences in other countries of this phenomenon of public to private asset stripping. When utility companies are moved into the private sector, a nation tends to lose not only that as an asset, but also huge amounts of tax revenue through high levels of debt and the offshoring of profit. Now the Colombian government will have to justify why the sale of this profitable company is in the public interest. We'll be following what happens on the tax cast. A group of responsible investors are challenging Google on its tax affairs at its annual shareholder meeting. Their proposals on the agenda calling for the company's board to, quote, adopt a set of principles to address the impact of Google's tax strategies on society, with particular focus on Google's employees, customers and suppliers, close quote. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that meeting. As we know on the tax cast, corrupt officials and criminals just love Swiss secrecy laws. And it turns out that Norway's sovereign wealth funds a significant shareholder of Swiss banks UBS and Credit Suisse, both investigated over accusations of concealment of assets, money laundering, abetting tax evasion and tax fraud. Norway apparently even owns the headquarters of Credit Suisse in Zurich. Yet Norway's also a champion of transparency and social justice. Member of the European Parliament, Anna Gomez, has written to them to point out the hypocrisy of their position. And on this month's role of dishonour, there was a public grilling this month at the US's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations for the company Caterpillar. They wanted to know more about their use of a Swiss affiliate to avoid $2.4 billion in taxes. Switzerland offered them a 4 to 6% corporate tax rate. And who set that up for them? Price Waterhouse Coopers. And they charged Caterpillar $55 million. Here's a question for you. How long does it take to release a report? Well, it depends if you want to sit on it. And that seems to be what the European Investment Bank wants to do. The bank's owned by EU member states, and years ago it lent $50 million to Mopani Copper Mines, which is mainly owned by the Swiss Glencore Extrata. It then turned out Mopani avoided paying tens of millions of dollars in tax to the Zambian government which is already overly generous when it comes to taxing foreign mining companies. The European Central Bank announced an investigation, but three years later, we're none the wiser about its findings. And how long do you think it takes them to answer a letter? The bank still hasn't responded to a formal complaint made by Christian Aid nine months later. And finally... Instead of serving a one-year prison sentence for tax fraud behind bars, billionaire and former Italian Premier Silvio Berlusconi will do community service, caring for the elderly four hours a week. Those are the Tax Justice headlines for this month. Now we're going to talk to Director of the Tax Justice Network, John Christensen, for his take on events this month. OK, John, don't know if we can possibly do this justice in a, a few minutes, but uh, there's been some new research on the amount of money held offshore by the very, very wealthy. Tell us about that. Gabriel Zuckman's new paper coming out of the Paris School of Economics reveals yet again that astonishing levels of wealth concentrating in the hands of a tiny, tiny minority. 
the Occupy movement talked about the 1%, but Gabriel Zuckman uh, talks about the 0.1%. Zuckman also confirms what many of us already know, which is that a huge proportion of this wealth is held in offshore tax havens. Well, what's new here, you may ask? What's new is that Zuckman's analysis confirms that the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and other organisations have been producing analysis of wealth and the global economy which are astonishingly weak, almost to the point of being absurd. And their numbers simply don't add up. And what this suggests is that a very large proportion of assets are held offshore outside the statistical databases of the international financial institutions. This raises important questions. As far as civil society is concerned, I think there's a scandal in the fact that some of this data is being collected, for example, by the Bank for International Settlements, but the Bank for International Settlements quite simply won't allow us access to that data, saying it's private data. It does seem to me that the Bank for International Settlements is guilty of withholding data, partly in order to downplay the importance of the offshore issue. Right, so that's why the figures don't add up, because there isn't access to the full figures on offshore private wealth. Well, I, for example, and people I know have asked for access to the Bank for International Settlements data on many occasions. I asked for it about 15 years ago uh, and was very politely refused because I was told that this information, although it is collected, is not made public. Um, Gabriel Zuckman and his colleague Neil Johansson at the Copenhagen Business School have been allowed access to some of this data, at least, which raises questions, why do they get access and why uh, haven't we? But, you know, that, that's not the, really the issue. The real issue is that, that, that this information has not been made public and but has equally has not been made use of by the International Monetary Fund and other organisations, which means that a huge issue around wealth concentrations and the way that wealth has been shifted offshore has simply been kept off the agenda by the international financial institutions. One has to ask... Whose interests have they been protecting? Let's talk about Lord Blencathra. Um, this month, his lobbying contract with the Cayman Islands has been terminated. Uh, Lord Blencathra, he's a former government minister, so he's pretty high up in the now ruling Conservative Party in the British government. Also a peer, which means he sits in the second House of Parliament, um, appointed, not elected. Anyway, Lord Blencathra insists he never fulfilled the lobbying part of his contract. £12,000 a month they were paying him. Lord Blencathra, who some of those with long memories will know of as David McLean, has previously been implicated in corruption rows. He was implicated in expenses row. He claimed £20,000 for improvements to his farmhouse, which was his main residence. Also, at one stage, he was trying to lobby to exempt both Houses of Parliament from the Freedom of Information Act. So this is clearly not a man who's a great believer in democracy or accountability. Now, once his role had been revealed by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, Blencastra's usefulness to the Khamenians was clearly uh, compromised and they quickly cut the contract. Right, because paid advocacy is against the rules. <laughs> what this story reveals, yet again, is that some UK parliamentarians, and I'm sadly it's quite a number of them, still haven't learned the lessons from past scandals. And they refuse to recognise that there's a deep conflict of interest between being a guardian of public interest on the one hand and being a lobbyist for private interests on the other. What's particularly bad in this case, of course, is that Blencathra was acting as a lobbyist for a world-famous and notorious tax haven. Yeah, I mean, what's a chap to do with that 12000 a month? And he did uh, assist in events trying to persuade UK companies to move jobs and taxable income, presumably, from the UK to the Cayman Islands. <laughs> Undermining UK interests. Shame on the uh, UK Parliament for continuing to allow people, lobbyists like this, to operate from within their ranks. OK, and very quickly, we can stay in Britain just for a minute. Um, the UK Chancellor has announced that it's really going to crack down on tax cheats. They're going to toughen up the law, not to tackle the corporate avoidance. That's such a big problem for the UK, but uh, tackling individuals. But uh, it's actually already an offence to submit a false tax return, isn't it? So <laughs> am I being a bit too cynical by pointing out this big announcement was made while the Chancellor was at an IMF meeting in Washington, trying to impress their 
friends and uh, looked like a really active G20 member. Yes, Her Majesty's government now plans to create a criminal offence in respect of failing to declare offshore income. This is being spun as part of uh, the government's attempts to crack down on rampant tax evasion by individuals. Whilst, of course, we welcome any move that will deter people from using offshore accounts to evade tax in this country and any other country, some people might think there's something illegal about holding an offshore account. There isn't. The illegality lies in not declaring any incomes arising from that. But under the existing laws, it is already illegal to not declare on your tax returns that you're receiving income or capital gains from an offshore account. So what's changed? As soon as you sign a tax declaration in this country and in most other countries, saying that that declaration is a truthful statement, but you failed to declare that you're receiving income from an offshore account, you have engaged in a criminal offence. Uh, is this a major new reform? Probably not. Right, so uh, quite a lot of spin going on there. Let's go and have a look at Nigeria now. We've had big news this month. It's doubled its GDP in one day. Uh, that's by including big industries like film and mobile phones in the uh, statistics and the economic figures. Uh, it makes it the biggest economy in Africa, which makes little difference to ordinary Nigerians, I guess, except that it seems that Nigeria isn't taxing very much at all, which does affect people there. And that is, uh, Nigeria is one of the only countries in the world now where more than one in ten children die before their fifth birthday. Right, this is at one level an extraordinary story of um, economic success and economic failure. This month they've revised the basis of their calculations of gross domestic product. GDP calculations of national income are widely used as a demonstration of economic growth. This is the first time that they've recalculated their GDP base in close to a quarter of a century. And so they announced earlier this month that their 2013 GDP estimates had increased by a whopping 90%. Now, the sad truth is, of course, that most Nigerians live on less than $1 a day, which is shocking. But the revised national income data shows that Nigeria has a far stronger economy than was previously being recorded. But this raises some really important questions about tax policies and tax governance in Nigeria. To begin with, the 2013 tax revenues are relatively healthy by African standards, 20% of gross domestic product, which is above the regional average. But, and this is the bad news, about two-thirds of the total tax revenues come from oil and gas. The non-oil and gas revenues hover around 6 to 7% of total GDP, which is worryingly low, even by African standards, and suggests shockingly weak effort by politicians to collect tax fairly and to redistribute wealth and income. Now, all of this, of course, is reflected in a very low level of public expenditure in Nigeria, in education, in training, in health, infrastructure and security. And UNICEF, the United Nations body, shows that Nigeria is one of the few countries in the world that has actually seen a deterioration in the last few years, since 2007. Right, and they're also receiving nearly $2 billion a year in aid, I think, whilst they're not taxing uh, some of the businesses there, I guess. And we've argued for a very long time, now is the time to shift away from pumping aid into countries like Nigeria, which is not acting effectively, and putting much more focus on Nigerian politicians to raise revenues in a fair and equitable sort of way and to use the tax revenues effectively to invest in Nigeria's long-term future. Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. TaxCast listeners know there's been a whole lot of fine talk from governments, the G20, OECD member countries, about tackling corporate use of tax havens. But, well, talk is cheap. This month, the tax cast looks at some plucky states in the US who got tired of waiting for the national government to act and did it for themselves. We're in the US state of Maine this month, known as the Pine Tree State. 
around 83% of its forest. It has beautiful mountains and a long, rocky coastline. With a population of 1.3 million, it's one of the smaller US states. It's also the latest state to say no to multinational corporations using tax havens to avoid taxes. Here's the sponsor of Maine's bill to reclaim that tax revenue, Representative Adam Good. Our state loses $10 million for each two-year budget based on these accounting tricks by multinational corporations. $10 million is a lot of money. That's how much money we, we lose each biennial budget by continuing to let multinational corporations hide their income in offshore tax havens. It creates an unlevel playing field. And small businesses in Maine don't use these tricks and they're stuck at a competitive disadvantage. And he knows he must be onto something good when the state of Maine starts getting letters from ambassadors in Liechtenstein and Luxembourg telling them this bill's a really bad idea. Of course, they're not tax havens, they say. They're just giving helpful advice to one of the US's smaller states on the other side of the world about how they should vote on tax reform. Adam Good again. You know, legislators get lobbied all the time by powerful interests, and it you know, kind of boggles my mind why you know, we would be prioritizing Liechtenstein or Luxembourg over taxpayers in Maine. Nike isn't going to stop selling shoes in Maine, and Apple isn't going to stop selling iPods in Maine because they have to declare their corporate income, even if they're hiding it in Liechtenstein or Luxembourg. Now, common sense tells you, doesn't it, that if a company in Maine pays its taxes based on the business activity they do in Maine, it's only fair if multinational corporations are expected to do the same. But their armies of accountants and lawyers cook up all sorts of ingenious tricks to cut their tax bill and hide their income in tax havens. It gives them a massive competitive advantage. It's hardly the American dream, is it? What's been the case uh, here in the U.S. is that there's been no you know, real tax reform since 1986. Phineas Boxendall of Consumer Research Body, U.S. Public Interest Research Groups. There's increasing problems with offshore tax haven abuse and states have just gotten kind of fed up of sitting on their hands waiting for Congress to come to the rescue, and it's it's not happening. And so now Maine is starting to have laws. There's some bills in some other places. There's a bit of a groundswell of states saying they're not going to wait anymore for Congress to change this. They're going to have to take matters into their own hands. And the kind of law Adam Good's trying to get enacted in Maine is something any state can introduce. It's very popular with voters, not least local business owners. 24 US states have already modernised their tax codes to make companies report on how profits are distributed among jurisdictions so they can try and tax them based on how much business activity they do in those places. For them, this reform would be especially straightforward. It can't come a moment too soon for the state of Maine. Here's Maine Senate President Justin Alfond. The number of families who are living in poverty and homeless is rising more than ever. Sadly, one in four children in Maine is hungry. It's the third highest rate of child hunger in the nation. That's unacceptable. As lawmakers, you put us in charge to make the tough choices and come up with solutions to these challenges whether it's providing health care to 70,000 Mainers, including 3,000 veterans through Maine Care Expansion, or keeping our funding promises to Maine's towns and cities. And here's some of the voices of the 70,000 people in Maine who've just lost their access to health care because the Maine governor refused to fund it. They're speaking here to the Maine People's Alliance. I have a blood clot. Now, I've also got asthma, which I... I, I... I need inhalers to to breathe. Yeah, I, I save my old inhalers just in case that, you know, I'm going to have an asthma attack and I'm going to need just one puff from one of them, you know. It's comforting to know that at least maybe one or two of them will have a little bit left in them. I've had uh, arthritis for 40 years since I was 18, and finally I was at the point where I could hardly walk by noontime. I wouldn't be walking now if, if the, I hadn't gotten that operation. And I, now I can walk in the woods, I can do all, most of my work I can do, you know, it's, it's great. So I've got, I had that opportunity. I'm not going to have it now because we're going to uh, lose Mank here. So I'm glad I got that done. And 
but I, I feel for the people that are not going to have that opportunity. Every time you go to the store or go to town, you see somebody that's limping, you know, or that's hurting and pain, and, and they're, they're in need of, of health care. If I woke up someday with, with a health care problem, um, I don't really know what I would do. I would worry about losing my house. It, it, it just not having any any access to health care is, is um, there's just so much uncertainty. I think that whoever is in office should be serving the people and keeping people from health care is not serving them. Adam Good again. There's a lot we could do with $10 million in a state like Maine. That's, that's a lot of money. We definitely prioritize Head Start and early childhood education programs. We definitely prioritize senior citizens and providing better access to prescription drugs. So those are a few things that I think you know would be high on my list. Every year, we consider cuts to health care. Um, we fail to meet our obligation to properly fund public education, and we cut programs for working families. Phineas Boxendor was involved in writing the U.S. Public Interest Research Group's report closing the billion-dollar loophole. If you know every state was to do this, we'd be talking about uh, over a billion dollars we added up. One of the things I think which is really important about this reform and this movement is it's something that is counted not just in dollars, but as a kind of reframing of the debate. People are so alienated by Congress here in the United States that when you start telling them about money lost in Congress and the deficit and such, they just tend to glaze over. But when you tell them about spending in their own state and they can relate it more to their own education programs, their own roads, etc., and really focus more on it, also you can get members of Congress, when they come back home to their own district, people are talking about it in a way which they're more engaged at. So it just kind of brings the issue home, literally and figuratively, for people to be able to organize about it at the state and more local level. Of course, this reform is a modest one. A billion dollars reclaimed from offshore corporate earnings if every state were to enact this legislation is peanuts compared to the money that's being lost to the nation as a whole. Estimates are the U.S. loses $150 billion of tax revenue a year to tax havens. But the U.S. Congress needs to step up and legislate to recover the majority of that. That's not to say those first states so far to enact this legislation don't have big ideas. First Montana, then Oregon, now Maine. Montana passed its law back in 2003. Last year that brought in $9 million that would otherwise have been lost to tax havens. Mike Caddis of the Montana Revenue Department. I can say that in the last session there was a bill so that we would have um, unitary worldwide reporting, which would be, I think, a, a positive step. It would level the playing field even more. That bill would have increased revenues another $8 million or so. Um, so it would have almost doubled the impact of the tax haven legislation. So in the long run, that's where I'd like to see us go. That bill, unfortunately, died in committee. So, you know, there's a political tension that exists here, and uh, hopefully we can kind of work through that with more education over time. And as the letters from the concerned ambassadors of Liechtenstein and Luxembourg show, there are powerful interests at play here, and many of them are, of course, closer to home. According to the Open Secrets lobbying database, last year all sorts of organisations, companies and bodies spent $3.2 billion on lobbying Congress and federal agencies and that's leaving campaign contributions completely out of the picture. And it's well worth it apparently. A study published in the Journal of Law and Politics found companies lobbying Congress for a one-off tax break for overseas earnings got a return of $220 for every dollar they spent. That's a 22,000% return on their investment. Nice. No wonder Montana, Oregon and Maine have had to take matters into their own hands. And it's an ongoing struggle. There was an attempt to repeal Montana's tax haven law recently, and Maine's not out of the woods yet with this legislation. Maine's governor, the same one who's refusing to expand health care provision for 70,000 Mainers, may veto the bill. Even though it's very popular, even though it will bring in an extra $5 million a year, 
It looks like it's going to come down to convincing enough Republicans there to vote to override the governor's veto. Phineas Boxendall. I hope that in a few years we'll be writing a report about how the states led the way and finally Congress listened to reason and closed some of these offshore tax loopholes and started holding these footloose multinationals accountable for paying their fair share that, you know, if they're using our infrastructure, our financial system, our court system and security, that they have to pay for it. And that that was something that Americans could come together on and, and finally change the rules for. That's something I'd like to see. And how about outside the U.S.? Of course, systems are very different in other countries, but like in the U.S., Local and regional authorities aren't waiting around for the national governments to act either. In Europe, some regions are working towards tax haven free zones. They're taking action to stop public contracts and public money going to companies who aren't paying their fair share. Director of Ethical Consumer and the Fair Tax Mark, Leonie Nimmo. The Tax Haven Free Cities and Local Governments initiative was launched in Stockholm in March. It brought together tax activists and politicians from across Europe who are forming a network of councils and local politicians that want to stop contracts going to companies that avoid tax. The European directives already allow for discretionary exclusion of companies that haven't fulfilled their tax obligations. There's really inspiring work happening in France where they're requiring the providers of financial services to local regions to publish their accounts on a country by country basis. And this has been a result of real grassroots action of local people targeting their local representatives. So now 18 out of 22 metropolitan regions in France have adopted this requirement. And that's been pushed up from a local level right to national level now. Last year, There was a major victory with a national rule for banks' transparency being introduced. And this was followed shortly after by a European amendment to the Capital Requirements Directive, which is also going to require a form of country-by-country reporting. So that's a kind of example of how pressure on local politicians can kind of filter up to the kind of higher-up levels. The key issue is transparency. It's not going to be possible to stop contracts going to tax avoiders unless you know who the tax avoiders are. So the the first thing that that areas are starting to require is transparency. And, you know, country by country reporting, it's not too much of a leap for local procurers to take that information into account. So the moral of the story, never underestimate local action. Back in the state of Maine... We'll be watching and hoping they'll manage to overcome their governor's objections to reclaiming their extra $5 million a year in lost tax revenue. You can find out more about Europeans coming together on local initiatives on www.taxhavenfree.org and you can read the report Closing the Billion Dollar Loophole on www.uspirg.org. You've been listening to the Tax Cast. We'll be back next month.